In what ways? In what way does the rise of chaos function as an extension to your last record, Blind Rage? If it does, that is. Yeah, it does. I think it follows a straight path that we've been that we started three albums ago, and we're trying to not leave that path. We're really trying to go forward and not go left and right or change anything dramatically. We're really just trying to give the fan what we started back then. Um, I think we have a style that works. We have a great team of people now that are, you know, producer, singer, label, everybody, and we're not trying to really change a winning team. Just trying to write new songs along the same lines with new ideas that we didn't have before. You know. So, so if someone would like tell you that the Rise of Chaos is just another accept album or like, uh, an album out of many accept albums, uh, what would you tell that person? Yeah, I don't see a problem with that, no. really. I mean, you don't have to change all the time. We're, we're trying to not change, we're just trying to get better and, and have new songs for the fans. Mm. But to change is always easier than I think to not change, you know. To do something consistently in a certain quality, over a longer period, I think that actually gets harder and, and harder. It's always easy to do something that you haven't done before, you know, because it's new and you know. But when you when you do something that you have been doing for a while, you're only trying to follow a style that you already have. You know, that's a challenge. But I think we we're doing all right. Yeah, and the fans will definitely immediately like. Yeah, uh, know that this is an accept right Yeah, that's a good thing though. Yeah. I believe once you have a style, you should be yeah. happy and, 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 and work with that. Yeah. You know, that's what we're trying to do. We have certain ingredients that work for us and we'll, that, we use them. Yeah. It's and as the long as the fans yeah. don't get tired of what we're doing, I think we're doing fine. Yeah. Is all the material newly written or do you like pick some stuff from your secret bag of unfinished riffs or something? When I tell you, we have a huge arsenal of a sh archive of unused and unfinished songs that we go back to periodically and on this album I can't believe that uh, I, I can't remember that we actually did that uh, on the last one there were a few songs that actually were based on older ideas like um, Fall of the Empire it was actually an ancient idea of mine that never came to fruition but on this album I don't think there was any so when you're writing riffs for a record, how many minutes or hours do you sit there with the guitar in order to find what you really Thousands. want to have? Yeah. I mean, it's incredible how many hours I spent there sometimes. spent Because a lot of times it's just wasted on following an idea that later on turns out to be not as strong as you had hoped, you know. So you have an idea, you work on it, you work some more on it, and you try to get it better and you have another idea that works with it and before you know it, you, you have to be honest with yourself and scrap the whole thing and you start with something else. Mm -hmm. So all these hours that you spend on that one song that you, you, you thought had something, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're really honest, you throw it away. But I think that's necessary because you have to be your own worst critic. You know, you have to be selective. You know, I know some people who, who think everything they do is just golden and, and magic just because they've done it, but I believe no. For each, each song that you write, you should be prepared to throw 20 away, or at least, maybe 50, I don't know. Could that be frustrating sometimes too? Yeah, but so be it. You know, I think being an artist, whether it's a photographer or, or anything else, or a painter, you can't expect everything that you do is just golden and, and magic. You gotta get it. No, it's not like that. You sometimes feel that you have a really great song coming, but after a while you sounds like, well, this song isn't really good. So. Oh, it turns yeah, out it happens all the time. Yeah. You know, sometimes you, it feels like you chased the wrong whatever. Yeah. You know, it's just, you, you're going for something that just doesn't turn out to be as good. But I think you have to be willing to do that and you have to give it all you've got. If you, if you give up too early, then it's also wrong, you know. And you can't also just sit at home and wait for the magic genius to strike you. I mean, I sometimes read these stories where people supposedly wake up in the middle of the night and they have this brilliant idea and it's boom and it's there out of nowhere. I never have that. Very rarely yeah. does something like that, if ever, happen. It's mostly you start on something, you try to get 
to perfect it and you polish it and mm. and then sometimes it survives and some other times it doesn't. Yeah. And your, your guitar playing is very characteristic for you. And uh, are you sometimes afraid of like coming out a little bit too similar to what you've done in the past? Of course. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Of course. So try to. And it goes back to what I said earlier. You have to be your own worst critic, and, and, and then you go and you play. It. Sometimes you I play it to somebody, or I play it to Peter, and I ask other people opinion. But especially when it comes to playing the solo stuff, I'm pretty much left to my own mostly because I don't really know who to ask. You know, when it comes to songwriting, I can always ask Gabby or Andy Sneap or play it to Peter, and and. and Get some reflection when it comes to solo stuff. I play to Andy a lot, and if he says something, hey, that's a bit too close to what you've done already, then I'll go back and change it. But a lot of times, these solo bits and pieces they happen just the very end. You know, it's usually the last thing I do. Once we've got ten strong songs, then I go to working on those middle sections and, and riff sections, and then very last, I put the solo and solos on and, and stuff. And at that point. Um, I'm usually the, the only one sort of worrying about yeah. is it any good or is it good enough. Mm -hmm. So how, how much do you work on the songs before you show what you've got to somebody else? A lot. Yeah. yeah, I sit there, like all of us, Peter does the same thing, I'll just, we sit at home initially and just try to come up with material basically, so that it's always easier to work on something together that's already is something mm -hmm. rather than two blank minds just sitting there trying to come up with something together. It's really hard. Yeah. It's always easy to build on something that already exists. You will never be that guy that like gathers the band, goes to the studio. No, and <laughs> I mean we've done that in, in, in the past, but it, I found it to be quite painful sometimes. Yeah. If nobody has an idea and you sit around the room and you try to come up with something, it doesn't seem to really work for us. No. Uh, Except has tried some different directions in the past, but the, the four latest records, they are kind of in the similar vein and mm -hmm. not left and right. Urgently, but, and strictly song-wise, do you feel like it's more important nowadays to be a little bit on the safe side more than experimenting? At this point in our career, yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't really see the point in doing that right mm -hmm. now because we kind of know what works and what doesn't, and we've done a bunch of experimenting in the past where we tried a more commercial approach or in the 90s where we were sort of trying to find or to redefine our style with yeah. going, you know, trying to go with the times if you want, you know, because all of a sudden it was all, all about grunge, so we tried to sound a little different and we just didn't really f feel comfortable doing it and the result wasn't even that great, you know, that we it's almost out of our system at this point mm. and I don't really see the point of doing it. Mm. You know, I know I'm quite glad that we have a style and, and, and that, that we are recognizable. As soon as you put that album on, oh, you know, that's accept. And that's a good thing. So why why mess with it? Why? <laughs> you know. So, as you told me, you were recording with Andy Sneap once again. So did he bring bring anything new to the table this time or, or were you just... Absolutely from where nothing. You? Andy never <laughs> brings anything to the... No. <laughs> Or were you just starting from where you left the last time? No, it's, it's actually a little different this time around because he was already like with one leg involved in the uh, Judas Priest production. So mm -hmm. we, we did a little bit of pre-production or early production in the fall when we thought, all right, let's just get what we can now and then maybe come up with a couple more songs later on. But at least let's use the time before I have to start with Judas Priest. Let's get what we can and put some basic tracks down and then you guys can finish it and work on it while you're on the road with Sabaton or while I'm in the studio with Priest and blah blah. And that's what we did. So we recorded everything we could of all the possible keepers and then fine-tuned that later on, which is great. We can Nowadays with Pro Tools and such, you can actually do that. You can sort of record that, that song even though maybe later on the middle section still slay changes a little bit or that last chorus is twice or instead of only once those minor changes you can still do and uh, so anyhow that's what we did and then uh, all of a sudden when this tour of 
with, with Sabaton came to an end, everything was quiet, worked out, and I had time to work on the arrangements in the hotel rooms on the road. And, and when we came off that tour, we knew, all right, here's the rest of those two, three songs, and here's all the changes we're going to make. We just went to the studio, recorded it like that, and boom, it was, it was almost very simple then. So that 80% of the time gets spent with massaging these song ideas to where they actually feel round and complete. So what lyrical topics do you deal with this time? Uh, a lot of different stuff. A lot of it is quite somber and, and, and dark, I think. Um, just It just so happened. I don't, I don't think it was necessarily planned or there's no big Agenda. Master plan before, or agenda before we start. It just so happens all the songs take on a life of them of themselves, and whatever the song needs, that's what the song gets, you know. And if it turns out to be a bunch of dark songs, then so be it, you know. And, and the way that we work is usually we have a we worry about the music first, the riffs and the melody lines and all that, and then quite early on. We worry about all right. What is the chorus? What is the hook line? What is the what are we singing here? What's the main idea of the song? And once we have that, we give that to Mark, and he can sort of fill in the blanks of the of the lyrics for the verses and the pre-chorus and, and all that stuff. But we sort of just leave it at that. Once we have a song, we say, hey, it's called Rise of Chaos. Go for it. What what do you what do you think of this? What what comes to your mind? And the artwork is, is it, it isn't typical accept stuff. I, no, it's I not actually. And what made you choose some to, such a front cover for the record, really? The set design. We had the set design for the last tour. Mm -hmm. and it was a big backdrop and uh, the whole stage was designed that way. And we really liked it. And I thought, you know, this would make a great album cover too. Mm -hmm. So let's just change it up slightly and use it for the album artwork. So you brought in a drummer that's in his early 30s by now and yeah a kid yeah <laughs> isn't it a little S risky? slave labor of kids you know <laughs> yeah. we're using we're exploiting kids now isn't that a little bit risky though it's like he's being kind of lonely in the band considering that yeah a little bit we thought about it, it crossed yeah. our mind but yeah. really once you get to know Christopher he's really uh, first of all 30 is not a kid no. <laughs> and we we still are like kids maybe somehow that we meet in the middle He's a little bit of an older soul in a way because he's really familiar with a lot of 70s and 80s rock stuff that he's always been a fan of and so he, he, he always, I mean I never think of him being just younger than we are, of course he is and, and sometimes it comes across but mostly it's, it's not really on anybody's mind. And his skills are the and, most important oh, thing anyway. And for a drummer being 30 years old, I guess he's in the top of his on the top of his game and mm -hmm. I mean he's really he's got the chops. So there's that, you know. Who wants to have a 60 year old drummer when you can get a 30 year old? Because <laughs> yeah. it's it's a young man's game a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm totally just kidding. old drummer. <laughs> <laughs> so, they're so, all used up by the time they're 50 yeah. or something, you know. <laughs> so we needed fresh blood. So we got a young kid. Cool. You're going 30 years more or something. And he's gonna last 30 more years, yeah. exactly. So, have the member changes before this record in any way changed the way you have written the songs? No. Oh. No, I don't think so. I mean, like I said before, we know how we want to go about making the album. We had all the, you know, the producer, the same singer, the same label, the same studio, all that stuff, and the same guys writing the songs. Mm -hmm. And just having Christopher, of course, he contributed and stuff, but it, I don't think he actually changed it. He made it better. By you know, awesome drumming, but I don't think the songs really changed dramatically mm -hmm. because of him. Like, out of all the work, yeah, uh, surrounding making an accept record, like, how much work do you personally do out of all that? <laughs> like with recordings and you know promotion, songwriting and whatever. A good chunk, but mm -hmm. at a certain point, I have to come back to my my sausage analogy. <laughs> Here it goes. <laughs> I think. Making a, an album is a little bit like making sausage. The less you know about it, the better it will taste, you know. <laughs> so I think we're making sausage and we're giving it to the fans. They should eat it and they should be happy that it tastes good. Yeah. But what all happens behind the scenes and who does what and what the ingredients and it's, 
some on some level this is really nobody's business and mm -hmm. I think it should stay that way and so even though I'm always happy to tell certain things at a certain level I think some things should happen behind closed doors and shouldn't be the concern of everybody Do you know what I mean yeah totally. um, and that's why I like my so being German I like the sausage analogy you yeah. know <laughs> You don't question. You don't. You don't really ask what goes into that sausage. You're just happy that it tastes good. So there. <laughs> so, out of your 80s records, uh, which one of them do you wish that it was made today instead? And you gotta pick one. Oh really? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Just they... have to mention one. Otherwise, you destroy my quest. <laughs> oh okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I believe what's done is done, and you shouldn't go back and revisit and re-question everything that's already ha happened actually mm -hmm. we wrote the song called what's mm -hmm. done is done and I strongly believe that mm -hmm. things of the past should just stay there mm -hmm. uh, because you can't change them and there's no point in going back over and over and get again and, and asking yourself what should I have done and could I have done and what if and blah blah mm -hmm. blah it's doesn't matter because it's happened a long time ago and mm -hmm. it should stay there so so Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, on the contrary, hypothetical, of course, if yeah. the rise of chaos had been out in like 1986, what would the fans have said about the record like this back then? Nobody knows, of course, and that's yeah. an interesting point because I often think an album is only. You can't judge it by itself. And who knows if, if we would have released like Blood of the Nations. 10 years prior if it would have been a success you know maybe the the times were were ready for accepting that album but maybe 10 years ago or 10 years later they wouldn't have been you know i think that's interesting uh i believe sometimes the world isn't ready for something and and that goes for music especially when it's totally uncool it can be totally cool ten years later or five years later. It's like fashion almost, you know. Yeah, I think like right place at the right time is very. Oh yeah, definitely. For like everything too. But it's almost out of my control at at some yeah. point, you know. You just you got to do what you can. I think as a musician, you should you should worry about the things that you can influence, yeah. and that's writing songs, performing, giving it your best. But it, it, after that, it's like up to the to the uh, to the people to decide whether it's it's right for them all we can do is just lay it out there and offer it mm. to the gods of metal yeah and it, but what if like suddenly people start to lose their interest in accept would you would you continue yeah. until the bitter end or would you like call today if the fan base would be gone I would, well I made that decision in the 90s when <laughs> yeah. when the people did lose interest yeah. and I had the feeling this whole thing has come to an end I personally mm. thought it was a good ride but maybe it's time to close it all up and worry about something else mm. I didn't really want to go down that road of hanging on to something that gets smaller and smaller and mm. I saw this road ahead where I would play smaller and smaller clubs and where I had to play music for a living even though I didn't really believe in it anymore mm. to me it's it's an honor and it's fun to make music, but I wouldn't really want to do it because I have to, you know, to make a living or to barely survive. I'd much rather do something else because there's a lot of things in life you can do, including photography, which I did, where you can make a living just fine and still a lot of fun. It doesn't mean as much, maybe, but it's not as hard, maybe. Because music to survive is it's a tough choice.